bad. I don't like it. Don't think we should have it. Well, we haven't got it. Nothing in that thing you read me guarantees we won't get it. Say, this here Constitution gives us order and authority, huh? Yeah. If we had order and authority under King George before the Revolution. Shucks, the Romans had order and authority under Nero, too. Only the wrong kind and too much of it. Oh, yes, but surely you can trust the man oh, who... Ah, no, nah, it ain't that I don't trust the men who wrote the Constitution. Oh, sure, I trust them, but them fellers won't always be around. Oh, yeah, well, you don't seem to understand. This is our own authority. Now, if you... Uh, the do... fact that it's our own don't make no difference. Constitution's fine as far as it goes. But the time to talk authority is after you put it down in black and white that we're all free men... Then we'll give you all the authority you need to keep us that way. What's more, we'll back it up with guns. Is that fair enough? Well, the way you talk, you'd think that... The way I talk? Didn't... I think it all depends on who's handing out authority. Whether it's to keep men slaves or keep them free. Didn't think it was necessary. The English thought it was necessary a hundred years ago. They've got a Bill of Rights. Where's ours? Well, maybe they'll get around to that. Maybe they'll amend the Constitution later. How do we know they will? Well, maybe they're planning. Some... I don't like this maybe business. When my husband Robert got killed at Trenton, there was no maybe about it. He got killed. He knew what he was fighting for, and he was glad to die for it. Now the fighting's over. I want to see it. <laughs> I don't know, Jerry. <clears throat> Sometimes I wonder whether you use your head for anything else than to keep your ears apart. I've got my opinion, and I stick to it. The Constitution looks good to me. I don't think it needs no adding to. Hand me that brick there. It's a foundation, that's what it is. Sure, it's a foundation. That's just what I'm talking about. But do you build a foundation and then go away and not build a house? Do you clear the woods and then let the ground go barren? Ah, oh, piffle. Ah, the way you argue. Piffle, eh? Is that all you can say? Hand me that brick there. What's the hurry? Give them time. It's not an easy job to get a new country running right. That's just the point. It's a lot easier to get it running wrong. Rights, 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 man. Can't you get that through your head? Why shouldn't rights be written into the Constitution just as much as rules on how to meet and when to vote and how much a senator should get paid? Not they alone. Not only little men like they, whose names escape us, whose names will never be recalled. The men who left their bloody footprints in the snows of Pennsylvania and buried their comrades in a clearing back of a clump of evergreens. The little men who took it, gave it, stuck for the duration, saw it through. Not they alone are doubters, wondering and grumbling, no. There are big names, too. Names now bandied on the tongue, but later to be lustrous. Later to be sated. Tom Jefferson, George Mason, Jimmy Madison, Pat Henry. Uh, now, take Jefferson, for instance. You know what he says? The Bill of Rights is what the people are entitled to against any government on earth. I'll take Pat Henry. I cannot give my oath to support this Constitution without a Bill of Rights. Now, take Mason. A wealthy planter of Virginia who'd rather plant a seed of liberty than 20,000 acres of tobacco. Government to be lasting must be founded in the confidence and affections of the people. Without a Bill of Rights, this government will end either in monarchy or a tyrannical aristocracy. This Constitution has been formed without the knowledge of the people. And it is not proper to say to them, take this or nothing. Well, then... The Constitution is in peril. This document, so handsomely engrossed in Philadelphia, there are doubts about it and suspicions. Will the states approve of it? Approve by ratifying? Will they throw it out? Or will they ratify providing certain changes will be made? The writing's fresh, still fresh upon the parchment. The text is clean, the ink is bold, the meaning clear. Only the worth of the Constitution is uncertain. 
All the points, the articles, the regulations are well put. But will they be well taken? The states decide. Not one man, two men, three men, but the states united. They decide. What says South Carolina? We ratify but offer four amendments. What says Massachusetts, where she stands? We ratify but offer nine amendments. New Hampshire, you. We ratify but propose 12 amendments. Rhode Island. We ratify but 21 amendments, please. North Carolina. 26 amendments and the Declaration of Men's Rights. Virginia. We ratify but we're suggesting 29 amendments and a Bill of Rights. New York. 33 amendments in both places, Rick. And we ratify... Now, now, Congress may begin, may call itself First Congress, may go to work, may tackle the new job of running a democracy. But it has one thing to remember. A promise is a promise. The people have been promised changes, promised amendments, promised that their freedom should be written down in black and white for all to see, for all to know, for all to live and prosper by. Well, yeah, it'll take time. No quorum to begin with. Bad roads, New York City hard to get to. There's some indifference, too. So, well, days go by. No quorum. Month of March goes by. No quorum. Well, patience. Good things grow slowly. Good things don't come running when you whistle to them. Good things are always fought for, worked for, grown. The acorn to the oak is not an overnight procedure, you know. God himself took several days to make the earth. But one day they begin. They sit down in a drafty hall in New York City and, and they go to work. At first they're busy with a hundred other things, but Madison, he keeps after them. He's a stickler for this Bill of Rights. Madison remembers what the people want. And by this time, carpenters are making changes in Federal Hall, adding more room. Now, the place has got to be enlarged. The government's growing. You know. And the representatives, all 55 of them, they work through the noise. They're making some additions of their own. They're working on the Bill of Rights. Do you think... 55 representatives of the American people sat in a hall in New York City, in a drafty hall, and made up articles of freedom? Do you think the congressmen from 13 states made up those freedoms out of their own heads, debated there, deliberated there, without assistance, all by themselves, from their own experience? Oh, no. They had much help from many nameless and unknown, from dust in quiet places, from broken bones deep in the earth, deep in forgotten earth, mixed with the empty clay, from bleeding mouths, burnt flesh, cropped ears, from numberless and nameless agonies. The delegates from dungeons, they were there. I said that men were born equal. That is all I said. The delegates from ashes at the bottoms of the stakes, they were there. The king did not approve. The gallows delegates, whose corpses lifted gently in the breeze, they too. They too. The exiled wanderers, the Christians killed for being Christians, Jews for being Jews. The Quakers hanged in Boston town. They made a quorum also. Prince, we are prince. The murdered men. The lopped off hands. The shattered limbs. The red welts where the whiplash bit into the back. Must you know what they said? Must you know how they argued? Must you be told the evidence, the silent testimony of the raised? 
must it be told verbatim. Listen then. <coughs> that was an argument for an amendment. <coughs> that was a speech in favor of an article of freedom. <coughs> that praised the passage of a Bill of Rights. How much of all this must be told to be believed? Must it be drawn on diagrams? X marks the spot where decency was last observed. The dotted line shows how the victim staggered. The arrow points to blood. The headsman, he was there in Federal Hall. The man who turned the ratchets on the rack. He sat in the assembly, too. Nero was there. Caligula. King Philip. Torquemada. Cotton Mather. All the tyrants and the martyrs who had gone before. That quietly, unseen among the representatives read from their memoirs, expert testimonies, found their ways into the record and between the lines. All the long and bloody history of fanaticism, murder in the name of God, torture in the name of love, crucifixion in the name of safety to the crown. My God. My God. He, too, sat in the Congress. The mild man with the scars in his hands and feet for the sight went through. He was a consultant in the business at hand. Had he not died because the rulers of a realm denied free speech? Was he not nailed up on a cross between two thieves, because his treatments were considered treason. He, the Son of God, was he not executed over an issue of the rights of man? Make no mistake about it. He was there. He sat beside James Madison and Elbridge Gerry and John Page in Federal Hall. Unseen he was. The men of Congress were collaborated with. They added up the gains and the losses and the brave words spoken and the brave songs sung. They weighed the drawn and quartered flesh they took into account the hemlock and the crucifix, the faggot and garrot. And then they framed amendments to the Constitution out of the agonies, out of the crisscross scars of all the human race. They made a bill of rights for their own people, for a new, a willful, and a hopeful nation, made a bill of rights stand against the enemies within, connivers, fakers, those who lust for power, those who make of their authority an insolence, the Congress of the 13th States instructed by the people of the 13 states, threw up a bulwark, wrote a hope, and made a sign for their posterity against the bigots, the fanatics, bullies, lynchers, race haters, the cruel men, the spiteful men, the sneaking men, the pessimists, the men who give up fights that have been just begun. The Congress 
wrote a ten-part epic. 